Welcome. We're so glad everyone could join us today for this Army uh, Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute webinar series. We're thrilled to have today with us Matt Murphy, PhD, to join us and talk about um, how to select and identify the right PRP system for your practice. Um, before I introduce Dr. Murphy, I just wanted to talk a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, we'll do a Q&A session at the very end. So if you would type in under the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, your questions, we'll be sure to address them at the end of the, end of the presentation. Dr. Murphy will take about 30 minutes in going through his lecture, talking about the science of uh, different PRP systems, and then, and then we'll take a Q&A session for about 20 minutes or as uh, long as needed to, to answer all of your questions. Um, and before we uh, do an intro to Dr. Murphy, I just wanna mention this Army conference that's coming up. Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute is holding a conference in Nashville uh, here coming up in just a few weeks, August 13th through the 14th. And uh, our ultrasound course on the 12th is full and sold out, but we still have a few seats for the conference 13th through the 14th, huge panel of various physicians talking on all Virgin medicine topics. And uh, this week is the final week to sign up to get the discount on the hotel. So if you're interested in coming, go to the website, the Army website, and um, look at the agenda topics and uh, all the different topics. Uh, anyway, all the different items will be covered there. It looks like the website, is that listed on the site or not? If, if not, we'll email after this um, a website to uh, a link to all the different agenda topics for the Army Conference. So uh, with that said, I want to just quickly introduce Dr. Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy has designed and implemented several new strategies in various autologous Regen Messin products. He's uh, been behind several different companies and developing different PRP systems. He's um, the senior researcher for Methodist Hospital Research, or I was the senior researcher for Methodist Hospital Research, that focused on adult stem cell and uh, biomaterials for gen medicine applications. Uh, he has been a consultant and spoke worldwide on gen medicine topics and, uh, and is a peer review public publisher, publicator for several gen medicine uh, books and chapters. Um, anyway, Dr. Murphy has his PhD in bioengineering from Rice University and a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Murphy, thank you for your time and uh, I'll turn the time over to you. All right, thank you, Dan, uh, for that kind introduction. And um, thanks to Army for the opportunity to, to present, talk a little bit about PRP today. The, the, the title of this presentation is called Not All PRPs Are Created Equal. Um, this is going to be very high level clinically, but it'll get a little bit nuts and bolts on the science. So I, I think it's a good introduction for people who are not familiar with the whys and hows of, of how we build PRP. Um, and it's a good refresher for everyone. So um, I hope it um, generates some interesting questions and dialogue for after the presentation. Uh, first, I want to have a couple disclosures. Um, Dan mentioned it, but I don't want anyone to be confused and think that I'm a physician when someone says, Dr. Murphy, I'm a scientist. Um, and I am a consultant for several medical device companies in the regenerative space, and I speak at a lot of conferences. Um, but this presentation is meant to be product and technology agnostic. We're talking about the science and the rationale about why we do regenerative medicine and how you go about designing or picking the best processor devices. So I get this question a lot. People ask, what is a, a good PRP? Well, first, you have to understand what PRP is. Second, we got to say, what, does, what do you mean by good? It all depends the eye of the beholder or what, what metrics we're using to judge good or bad. And it all depends on the clinical objectives. So PRP, by definition, is platelet-rich plasma. It is any enrichment of platelets higher than the peripheral whole blood platelet count. So even if you only enrich blood by one platelet, you could say technically it's PRP. And that's where, in my opinion, a lot of the imposter products get around calling it PRP 
it's not really what we would think to be a good PRP. We'll talk more about that in some upcoming slides. Um, PRP is generally divided into two families, leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor. Leukocytes are the white blood cells. Generally, we think about inflammation because of the, uh, the multinucleated white blood cells. These are things like neutrophils, granulocytes, macrophages um, that respond to injury or sickness in the body. So they are inflammatory. They're going after whatever the bad things are in the tissue, but there are also regulatory and immunomodulatory white blood cells that probably have benefit and are not necessarily inflammatory that are part of white blood cells. So back to these definitions, if you concentrate white blood cells and platelets together, it's generally called leukocyte rich. If you try to concentrate platelets and not take all of the white blood cells, um, it's leukocyte poor. The note at the bottom says there are some that you're even trying to strive to have a leukocyte rich, sorry, a leukocyte free version of PRP where you're only getting the platelets and the growth factors and you're not getting any white blood cells. But it's, it's, it's challenging to obtain a high yield of platelets and zero white blood cells. Um, I think I have a slide coming up that shows red and yellow and the red blood cells, in my opinion, get a bad, a bad rap. When you get all the white, a lot of white blood cells, just from how the cells separate, you get more red. So your PRP looks more red in color if it's leukocyte rich. If you're leukocyte poor, the PRP tends to be more yellow or amber in color. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's just the presence of the red blood cells. So leukocyte rich, red, leukocyte poor, amber. The components of PRP, first and foremost, obviously platelets. And th these are not um, cells in terms of they have a nuclei and they're dividing, et cetera. They're not, you can really think of them more as little sacs full of growth factors and cytokines. And upon injury or activation, they're, they are activated, they open up and they spill out their cytokines and they, they send out this cascade of signals that recruits other cells in and stimulates all kinds of other mitogenic which is proliferation, cell growth, cell divisions, angiogenic, um, and, uh, and, and other properties that stimulate healing and remodeling. White blood cells are the leukocytes. Uh, the mononuclear cells, as I indicated earlier, can be regulatory or, or modulatory to the inflammation, while the multi or polynucleated white blood cells are the more inflammatory. Uh, there are also proteins and cytokines that are in the plasma because when we centrifuge blood and we get all the different components, PRP comes in a fluid that is plasma and there are billions of different kinds of proteins that are dissolved in that plasma. It's a great buffer. It, it mitigates inflammation and pain and arthritis just as a buffer alone, but there are many other anti-inflammatory and anti-degradative enzymes and proteins that are in that plasma that are really useful. So they have benefit as well. When we centrifuge blood, um, the heaviest components, which are red blood cells, sink to the bottom. You have this little white layer we call the buffy coat, which is white blood cells. And depending on how fast and how long you spin your blood, it dictates are the platelets going to land right at the very top of that buffy coat? and be mixed with the white blood cells when you, when you collect a product, or are the platelets going to be remain suspended in the plasma or just above the buffy coat so that they can segregate differently? Platelets are lightest, then mononuclear cells, then the multinucleated white blood cells, which are more inflammatory, and then into the red. So depending on where you pull your blood or your product, that's going to dictate the composition of your PRP. Not every device allows you to make the decision on where you're gonna make the cut. It's kind of like this device, you only get one flavor. This is a gross generalization of the process I just described, but if you centrifuge it hard and or long, you get uh, what we call leukocyte rich PRP at the top there. Um, the same goes if you were to spin bone marrow aspirate and make bone marrow concentrate where your platelets and white blood cells converge in one buffy coat and the plasma is more or less acellular. If you were to centrifuge at a lower G-force and or less time, 
the platelets don't condense with the white blood cells. And so you have the ability to take that plasma, I call it a cloud, just because the, plate, the plasma is more cloudy um, due to the platelets floating around in the plasma. And you can do a second processing step. Some people will do a second spin. Uh, some people will uh, filter that and, and consolidate platelets. Or sometimes you can spin it somewhere in the middle where the platelets are hovering just above the white blood cells so that you could collect platelets and just the top of the white to get the whites you want, but leave back the whites that you don't want. And then this kind of brings that question, where do you want to cut your deck after you've segregated all these different components based on their density? When we centrifuge blood and bone marrow aspirate, you want to see an enrichment. That's the whole point of doing centrifugation. We take what the body has, we're going to supercharge it by raising the level of the things that we want. We don't necessarily want to increase the things that we don't that we are neutral about, and we certainly don't want to increase the things that we do not want. So as, as, a, as a baseline, platelets are somewhere between 150 and 250 million per milliliter or thousands per microliter when you're doing your CBC count. And you should expect, I'm generous here when I say 3x to 10x, really I think 4x, 5x is what you would consider to be decent PRP. Um, certainly you can get 10x. Some have reported if you go above 20x, now you're too concentrated and you could see a negative effect of that PRP. Uh, whole blood has a uh, white blood cell count of three to six million in, in circulating blood normally, unless the person has an infection or something else going on. And so when we spin it down, if we're trying to make leukocyte poor, you wanna make sure that you have no more than three million per uh, milliliter so that we're not increasing the white blood cell count over baseline. But it's very common in leukocyte rich, or if we were doing like bone marrow concentrate, that you would see that same three X to 10 X enrichment above baseline. Um, MSCs, we're not going to talk about bone marrow today, but you, you they exist in bone marrow aspirate, but they're not in blood. PRP should not be confused with a stem cell therapy because there's no stem cells in the peripheral blood that we're enriching. And the useful plasma proteins, some of which I described earlier, they do not concentrate based on centrifugation alone. So when we spin it in the, in the lab or so the bench top centrifuge, the concentration in blood is the same as the concentration in PRP. If you want to elevate those protein concentrations, you're going to have to do something like filter and make a plasma protein concentrate. As an evolution of, of injections and biologic therapies, I'm oversimplifying and I'm not a clinician, but early on dry needling, needling and prolotherapy basically serve to cause agitation, irritation at an injury site that wasn't healing, these little micro injuries were to send out inflammatory signals and recruit nearby cells to elicit some kind of healing response. Corticosteroids came on the, on the scene and were very powerful at suppressing inflammation and therefore pain, although scientifically we start to see that repeated dosing of corticosteroids kills chondrocytes that are resident in cartilaginous tissue, like in joints and in the disc and the spine. So you do not want to do repeated steroids or you're going to have long-term toxicity to that tissue. Biologics, on the other hand, the, one of the best things about it is the worst thing that can happen is that nothing happens. If someone fails a PRP or a bone marrow type therapy, usually their status is the same as what they started. Now, most people do benefit from it, but you're not making the situation worse short-term or long-term. Leukocyte Rich did have inflammatory response, and that got some of that simulation in, but it also provided uh, anabolic and, and anti-inflammatory factors and growth factors to stimulate healing. So it went above and beyond simply trying to agitate the injury. Leukocyte poor focused only on those anabolic functions by removing some of the pro-inflammatory white blood cells and a stem cell therapy like bone marrow has MSCs and that takes it to another level because mesenchymal stem cells have their own unique capabilities in modulating inflammation and signaling the cascade of healing and remodeling in real time. So it's also kind of like the, the hierarchy inverse of of these therapies. 
is there a dose effect? I'm sure that there is. I'm sure there's a minimum and a maximum. Uh, a lot of the, the best clinicians in this, they shoot for here, we, we said seven and a half X above baseline. Um, that could be considered aggressive, but that's probably ballpark where people try to land on their therapy. Based on in vitro studies only, when you get to 15X, 20X above baseline, you start seeing diminishing returns or even the more you use, the less benefit that you get. So we don't need to try to focus on, oh, let's take 200 cc's of blood and concentrate it down to three to have the most super duper PRP you could ever make. That doesn't seem to have any benefit and it could, it could have negative impact. So trying to be in that 4X to 10X range is where we're going to shoot for. By the clinical indication, tennis elbow was one of the very first uses of PRP in the 90s. It's a soft tissue injury. It responded exceedingly well to the first generation leukocyte rich PRP. That inflammation stimulated tenocytes, probably local MSCs, which are pericytes on the blood vessels. That soft tissue is vascular, so there are stem cells nearby. Fibroblasts respond, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, these are all responding to that PRP, and you get a remodeling, maybe a protoscar tissue and remodeling. And we have very good, many publications backing that up, the, the long-term efficacy and the superiority of PRP over more conservative control type uh, treatments. Uh, hip osteoarthritis, and I'll just go ahead and say most of these arthritic degenerative kind of conditions. There's not great results from, from PRP in terms of long-term or reversing and regenerating. We would never tell someone we're going to regenerate your meniscus in your knee or a blown out disc in your back from a PRP injection. But what it does have is these anabolic and, and supportive growth factors and cytokines to stimulate repair and healing of the cells that are there. Um, and it's going to mitigate a lot of the pain drivers and inflammatory signals associated with degenerative conditions. We really don't have much data at all that would support things like bony fusion because there are no active cells in PRP that are going to cause bone to grow. Um, avascular necrosis, I, I've seen on... LinkedIn and these other places where people that they're opting for not doing bone marrow and AVN, particularly in the femoral head and the hip, um, and they're just injecting PRP and in, trying to stimulate the osteoblasts and the endothelial cells to remodel that, that edema, um, but it doesn't compare to bone marrow concentrate. So I would stay away from that for PRP, ACLs, uh, other ligaments, those, those tissues are avascular. So we're sending out signals, but there's not necessarily a, a resident stem cell or progenitor cell population to respond to that PRP the same way that muscle and tendon has those other kinds of cells. So muscle and tendon injuries are really the sweet spot for PRP. Back to the argument of good or bad. Here we have showing the red versus the yellow. Is it leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor? Leukocyte poor tends to have fewer platelets, but it's also has less of the white blood cells, it's less inflammatory. People are gonna complain less after a knee injection of leukocyte uh, poor than leukocyte rich because they're gonna be like, ah, I got a little bit of a flare up from the inflammatory cells. Um, Long-term, does it make a difference on the joints, leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor? It doesn't seem like it. Um, so use your own judgment on, on what you wanna use, but also use good scientific judgment of, what am I trying to do here? Do I want to stimulate inflammation or do I simply want only anabolic and, and suppress inflammation? And that, that should help drive your decision. In uh, degenerative disc and degenerative joint, there's a lot of parallels going on on the biochemistry and the matrix metalloproteinases that are further breaking down the the, the extracellular matrix of that tissue and, and leading to a further degradation of the joint or the whether it's a, a long bone joint or a joint in your spine. Um, using these biologics seems to make so much sense because uh, it's not 
an irreversible procedure like doing a total joint or a spinal fusion. But it's it's something to give you hope that you're actually going to heal, unlike just repetitive steroid injections. I mentioned soft tissue is the sweet spot. Those, those tissues are either vascular or perivascular. So they've got access to a lot more cells to respond to the PRP. Save the meniscus. This is a cause I'm, I'm as dear to my heart. Um, in, in a number of studies that were reviewed in, in, in this, uh, this article, seven out of eight show that arthroscopy was not better than other non-surgical injections, including PRP. So you can feel good that you're not making the patient any worse when you do a PRP injection in, in knee arthritis situations. Uh, it's, it's very reasonable as a first attempt. And, and if it doesn't work for the patient, you can always consider a follow-up injection of another PRP. Maybe they want to move up to a stem cell injection like bone marrow, or maybe they want to pursue surgery, whatever it is they want to do. Um, the, all the options are still on the table when you start with the PRP injection. Intraarticular type injections, I think the field has shifted to using the leukocyte pour for the reasons we've already discussed. It's less inflammatory. You're not going to see a flare up, but you're still going to get all the benefits of the growth factors and platelets and the IRAP A2M type proteins that are in the plasma. In the spine, there are more papers coming out every year. Really about four or five years ago is the first articles that we saw. Um, Greg Lutz and others have, have demonstrated that they've, they've seen benefit from doing intradiscal PRP. He found that there wasn't a big difference between using leukocyte and leuco sorry, leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor. Generally, uh, younger patients and the earlier onset of degenerative disc disease you see it, the better they respond, but you know, go figure. That's pretty much true for anything in, in practice. Um, is it better than bone marrow? I can't say that. I probably wouldn't say that, but is it a reasonable first course, again, for younger or more mild DDD? Possibly. Uh, use of epidural PRP. This question comes up a lot. It's like, oh, is it safe? Like, can I it's a biologic. Am I going to do something weird going to happen if I inject epidurally? The, my go-to, I guess, response is, well, doctors have been doing blood patches for decades. We don't have any concern at all about injecting whole blood in. So a purified version that we've derived from blood, you shouldn't have any more concerns about that. And, and in truth, whether it's PRP or platelet lysates, like this uh, Centeno study I'm showing here, show that there's a great deal of pain reduction associated with epidural PRP injections, almost uh, no adverse events. And if it is, it's things that you would expect from doing like a blood patch. And whether it's the needle that's causing an adverse event or something related to the clotting, but um, all in all, it is a very safe and potent option. We have to always consider the biochemical as well as the anatomical and biomechanical environment. Uh, the, the, I didn't write anything about mechanical here, but obviously if there is a mechanical problem, it probably has to be addressed by surgery. Biologic is not going to reattach a torn ACL by itself. But um, if it's more of disease of the tissue, arthritis, the biochemistry is the driver here, well, let's try to attack these things like interleukin-1 beta, TNF-alpha, the the enzymes associated with arthritis and degeneration, which are called MMPs. And we do that through anabolic, mitogenic type cytokines, like I have listed here, and these proteins like IRAP, which is the antagonist to IL-1, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist protein, and A2M, which is alpha-2 macroglobulin. A2M, its function is it binds up these enzymes and deactivates them permanently as well as it binds up the receptors for um, uh, molecules associated with inflammation and pain. In order to maximize PRP, we can achieve personalized medicine. So you, the clinician, can say, this is what I believe is going on in this person's case. This is how I wanna customize that therapy. 
I can determine what the platelet dose is or the enrichment factor if I'm using the right process or the right device. I can determine, do I want white blood cells? Yes or no. What type of white blood cells do I want? Do I want a little inflammation or do I absolutely not want inflammation? Do I want to enrich those proteins by doing a secondary concentration of plasma? And what volume do I want to use? Some systems, they can only give a good yield if they're giving back, say, 10 cc's. Well, if you're doing a small joint injection or a small disc injection, you're not going to use 10 cc's. So I want the control of give me what I want, but also let me make it in the output volume that I want. These are things to always consider when you're picking what process or product you'd want to use. So on, on good versus bad, as we said, you just consider what is the objective here and what, what's a win for you, what's a win for your patient? What things are you addressing biochemically that should drive your decision on which flavor of PRP to use? Um, this is my little cheat seat chart um, for arthritis leukocyte poor versus leukocyte rich. One is anti-inflammatory, one is pro-inflammatory. Short term, you're going to probably get a little more flare up in pain with the leukocyte rich, but long term, both have shown similar levels of success. In soft tissue, I'm a believer that leukocyte rich is probably better long term. I know there are some uh, people that are outspoken in some companies for sure that once they cross the Rubicon to, I want leukocyte poor this time and all the time, that's all they push. Well, there's probably a reason why in the early days of PRP, leukocyte rich was doing so well, and it could be associated with that inflammation. So red PRP, leukocyte rich, whatever you want to call it, the more inflammatory is not necessarily always inferior. Degenerative disc, um, there's less data to support it in general, and then to, to get into leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor, I think that just it warrants more research. Uh, back to the what is good, what is bad, I just say, well, bad PRP, in my opinion, is an inappropriate application or combination of these factors that are in blood for that specific injury. And a good is the opposite. So if you can justify this is what's going on, this is what I'm using, then that determines if it was good or bad. The same PRP may be good in one application and it may be bad for something else. In terms of the future, I think uh, we will see as more people are characterizing, as more people, more clinicians are characterizing the PRP and we're getting better intelligence about platelet counts, white blood cell counts, volumes that are injected, starting volume, final volume, injectate volume, are we enriching proteins or not? That will show a dose effect associated for all these different applications that we're concerned about. And that will clarify even more if it's this condition, this is what we should do. If it's that condition, it's that what we'll do. We we're seeing, we've seen some of that in bone marrow so far, trying to characterize mesenchymal stem cell dose and correlate that to clinical outcomes. PRP is not there yet, but it's coming very soon. Will it be a prerequisite to surgery? I certainly think so. Why, with all of the great outcomes, early studies, small studies, obviously anecdotal stuff, and now more and more large study, we're talking 30 patient, 50 patient, 200 patient in controlled trials using autologous biologics, we see such great out outcomes and virtually zero adverse events at a cost that's only a fraction of surgery. And it's also only a, a fraction of the risk associated with surgery. So why would we not want patients to try and fail biologics before moving on to surgery? I think without a doubt in the future, we will all be doing uh, biologics as a, as a first wave response to musculoskeletal injuries. As we close this presentation and we want to talk about how do we choose the best device, well, what is the enrichment we're shooting for? Because some devices absolutely cannot hit a certain target or they can't do it based on whatever volume that you're trying to do. If, if you start with 60 cc's, which for whatever reason was a very common volume, input volume for a lot of the name brand systems on the market, and you bring it down to six cc's, by definition, a 10x enrichment is what you would get 
assuming that you got 100% of the things you were going for. Now, do you get 100%? No, no system gets 100%. They might get 70%, 80%, maybe even 90% of what they're going for. So that's how you get to that 10X. Some of these, I'll call them just cheap hematology tubes or test tubes that are out there. They, you put in like 10 cc's and it gives you five cc's back. Well, assuming they got everything you wanted, at best, that's a 2x. And we know that no system and process is perfect. So is that really enrichment? Is it? Would you really call that PRP? Maybe by definition, but it's not really what we're trying here. So these little cheap tubes, just say no. Does the application that you're trying clinically call for leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor? And can a product that you look for deliver leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor or the flexibility to do either? And does it allow you to have control over the final output volume when you're doing leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor? That is definitely a shortcoming in a lot of devices on the market where you can pick one or you can pick the other, but you can't have both at the same time. And you, I would implore you to, that you would want to have that control so that you can truly customize every therapy for every patient. Uh, the last point, it's on here last, but it should not be your last concern, which is the number of sterile breaks. Some devices, uh, especially that first generation of, I guess you call them good PRP, but they might require four or five different accessing of the device, whether it's loading blood, transferring to a, another chamber or another separate tube, and then accessing to drain out one fraction, accessing again to drain out something else. And every time you do this, you're increasing the odds that you theoretically could contaminate your final PRP, which absolutely you don't want to do, especially in a surgical situation. So um, keep that in mind when, you, when you're demoing a product, like can, can I keep this down to two or three syringes? In conclusion, um, dosing is possible to achieve based on volume management uh, of what you put in, what you get out, and how good the processor device is in, in concentrating or, or capturing the fractions that you're interested in. We shoot for a, a target dose of uh, one to one and a half billion platelets per milliliter, which is you know, somewhere in that five, four, five to 10 X range. Um, theoretically, we have an upper limit of, you don't wanna go above 3 billion. Uh, white blood cells, do you want none at all? Or do you want as many as you can get for maximum inflammation? Or do you want somewhere in between because you want a little modulation, but not overblown inflammation? That's up to you. Um, and it also depends on the device that you use. Uh, that's really the, the end of my presentation today. I, I thank you for your attention and um, Hopefully we have some good questions and discussion to follow. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Murphy. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, looks like a few are asking for a little bit more specific guidance on uh, a couple topics. So you touched on this a little bit, but it, um, maybe if you wanna expand on it. So there are various products out there that only require 10 to 20 cc's of blood. Um, would you recommend these kits for ortho injections? Um, generally speaking, I would not recommend things like that because, uh, for the reasons that I discussed a second ago, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to bump platelet concentrations enough above baseline that it's different than blood. When we go from 20 cc's to 10 or from 10 cc's to five, or I don't know, even if you did try to do 20 to five, those systems are also not very efficient. If you're just spinning blood in a tube and you're coming down with a syringe and a needle and trying to eyeball where the end of the, of the needle is and suck out the things that you want, that's not efficient at capturing it. And even if you got all of them, you're talking like what, a three X enrichment. So you're not that much blo above blood. So if you're trying just to save a buck, oh, I, I can buy this kit for, a hundred bucks instead of 250 or 300 bucks or whatever it is today. Okay. Well, if you really want to save money, why don't you just inject blood? Perfect. Uh, next question. There's a 
some systems out there that are considered completely closed system. Is that necessary? You talked about avoiding multiple touch points, but is a completely closed system uh, necessary? What would you say about that? Well, it, the, how, how a clinician manages their procedure and their procedure room, um, it probably dictates it all. Like if, if you've got a very tidy process, having a couple syringes involved is fine. You can't, there's no such thing as a 100% closed system. You have to take blood from the patient and transfer it to a device. And at the end, you have to put a syringe on a device and, and extract your PRP. So there's at least two sterile breaks uh, just from that alone. Now, one or two in the middle may be necessary. And as long as you're cognizant of where my syringe is, always using a clean syringe, is everything capped in between steps so it's not open to the air, um, that's fine. Doing multiple perforations of the same port sometimes could introduce more risk having to leave something open for an extended period of time, or um, when you get up to like five, six, seven different accesses of the device, that's probably too much. Perfect. Uh, next question. There seems to be a growing trend of using A2M. What studies or science, what is that, what are studies or science telling us about adding A2M to our PRP? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will give kudos to a, a physician and, uh, and researcher by the name of uh, Dr. Guy Scuderi. He's actually a spine surgeon that made his own company based solely on A2M. Um, but he showed a lot of what A2M can do in a large subset of uh, degenerative joint and degenerative disc patients where just the A2M binding up the enzyme slows down the progression of arthritis and degenerative disease, and also simultaneously or in parallel uh, binds up the pain receptors for TNF-alpha and IL-1 so that the patient gets pain relief. Now, is that therapy by itself just A2M only enough to get the whole package? I think no. Do you? Why would you only want to do that anyway? We're taking blood and we're centrifuging it, so in my personal opinion, you would want PRP or bone marrow concentrate if you're going to take bone marrow aspirate, and then the concentrated proteins from the plasma that you get by spinning either blood or bone marrow and combine those. So it's almost like a, a regenerative kitchen sink. We're giving growth factors from platelets. We're giving A2M from plasma. We're giving IRAP from plasma. All these other fibrin and matrix building proteins that are in plasma. And if you had bone marrow, you're also getting stem cells too on top of that. So it is a very multimodal therapy that, that goes into treating this patient because as we all know, every patient's different, every injury is different. So you don't always know this patient's going to respond to platelets or this patient's going to respond to A2 or have the biggest response. So why not do our best to enrich all of these things that we know to be beneficial simultaneously and give the patient back as much as we can from what we harvest. Perfect, that's great. I have noticed a, a huge growing trend in new studies coming out with A2M and, and just a demand for A2M. So be it, it really is low hanging fruit. In the old days when you centrifuge uh, blood or bone marrow, people were throwing away the top 20 or 30 milliliters of platelet poor plasma. Like, oh, this doesn't have platelets in it, it's junk, we don't need it. Well, it turns out that's where a lot of those goodies were. So by filtering it or concentrating it, we can reduce the volume so that it can be injected separately or combined with your PRP into a, into a, a more well-rounded biologic. Perfect. Okay, next question. What is an economic cell counter you can buy for private practice to quantify PRP and how accurate are they? I'm not in, uh, in the business of uh, promoting any kind of cell counter. Um, once upon a time when I was in the stem cell world, I used something called a nucleo counter, um, but that really was for measuring white blood cells and stem cells. When you get into PRP, basically anything that can give you a CBC is good. It's going to give you platelet counts. 
it's going to give you a differential of different white blood cells. Um, it's kind of funny that we've learned that um, a lot of companies will sell a veterinary version that is the identical equipment of human, but at a fraction of the cost. So if you're trying to do the most that you can for the least amount of money, you might look at that that route. Um, is it a CLIA, whatever level, FDA certified for a hospital hematology lab? And do you need that? Is this really more for just quality control on your end so that every time you do a spin, you can feel confident? Or is it you're doing great by the field and you're trying to record data so that we can have correlations later on patient response to different levels of different cells? If that's all you're looking for, you can find a system on your own or through other companies that, that, that provide those that are internally validated that with whatever standards they use, they're gonna give you a more or less accurate uh, interpretation and reading of these kinds of cells that we're most interested in. Perfect. I know there's, yeah, some, some systems out there that are designed for private practices, they're gonna probably cost around $20,000. Um, we'll have Army send out an email with some specific companies that might be helpful. We'll gather up some information and send those out. We'll also send us a little more information on A2M because it sounds like that's a topic that's um, of interest. Um, you you mentioned um, flexibility. Well, here, I'll just read the question. You talk about flexibility in a system. Can you expand on why that is important or what features makes a system flexible? Sure. Um... Some systems were designed primarily to make leukocyte rich PRP. And then um, they don't have an ability to capture the platelet fraction without also collecting a bunch of white blood cells and red blood cells. So that's the only flavor you can get with that device. If all you're doing is a particular kind of injection that calls for leukocyte rich, that's fine. But if you were have a, a broad practice where sometimes you want leukocyte rich and sometimes you want leukocyte poor, you want that ability to start collecting with the biologic fraction that you want and then stop collecting before you get to the things that you don't want. Uh, the other part of that equation is volume. So say a lumbar patient uh, needs two to three cc's for their disc injection versus uh, a knee or a hip you might try to get away with doing eight to 10 cc's for an injection. Um, just, I know for some people like, wow, that's a lot, but think about all those good proteins in the plasma. So if the joint can take it, why not put more of those beneficial proteins in there? But in, in, the, in the process of doing that, can you still get the 70% recovery of platelets, 80%, 90% in the small volume as well as the large volume? So I don't know if that answers the question, but um, to me, a lot of systems, like they might be able to make small volumes, but they don't get a high recovery. Or the flip of that is they can only get the high recoveries that they advertise when they do a 10 cc output. Perfect. Similar or related question. What is high concentration of PRP? Is there any unique patented devices out there on the market that, um, that, that distinguish them themselves to consistently provide high PRP? Um, I, mean, I guess high PRP might be just like this definition of what is good PRP. Yeah, it it all depends right. on what it is you're trying to accomplish. Are there devices that get 5X, 10X even? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know. I, they, most of the big name brands, can do something like this. I would say the ones that are newer to the market are much better at that. Uh, some of the big name brands that are old technology are not as good at that. And these little 10 cc and 20 cc blood tubes can't do that at all. You're lucky to get 3x enrichment. So you're not going to be able to achieve high dose. And if someone's coming to you because they're in such debilitating pain for their knee arthritis or their disc in their back, that little bit of volume that you're able to inject, why would you only want to do a 2X or 3X when you have the capability with a slightly more expensive, maybe, maybe not, 
but a much better and more powerful product that can hit you, get you these high concentrations of either leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor as you desire. Okay, perfect. I think this is related to the volume discussion on high volume versus low volume of blood. Um, because he said, why use a lot at all? And I assume they're talking about a lot of volume. Why not use centr centrical force and time and two spins to get what you want? Mm. I don't exactly understand the question, but it the number of spins is irrelevant if the final composition is what you're going for. I know that there are some people that make their own PRP, kind of like with the, their own like lab setup that they do. Um, there are some commercial products that uh, also do two spins. And that's just how that technique attempts to concentrate platelets without white blood cells. If you're doing leukocyte rich, there's no really, really no reason to do two spins. I know one company does a double spin bone marrow and for the life of me, I don't understand the philosophy there because you, to me, you would want stem cells and platelets concentrated simultaneously and you do that through one hard spin. So if, if you can get platelets concentrated with or without white blood cells, that's the goal. There are more than one ways to skin that cat and all these different products on the market do that differently. Perfect. Uh, another question, some PRP kits cost as much as $400 a kit. Are those systems better than a $250 kit? Um, well, talk about better, good, high, whatever that means. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to know what the clinical indication is. What is the biologic composition of PRP we're trying to achieve? And then what is device A and device B capable of doing? That's what I meant earlier when I talked about the versatility of the device, because if you land on a device that can accomplish all of these things, it can give you leukocyte rich in a small volume or a large volume, leukocyte poor in a small volume or a high volume, but now you've kind of got all your bases covered with one product. Some of these products, whether they're $200 or $400, may not be a jack of all trades. Perfect. So uh, I guess we can summarize some of those things you just said, because this question is, what are the features you consider in selecting a PRP system? So it sounds like, uh, well, I'll let you answer the question. I think throughout the lecture, you've kind of touched on those, but maybe touch on those top five or six that you've mentioned throughout. Yeah. I'm sorry for dipping in and referencing bone marrow so many times, but I just, to me, I'm always thinking about them because they're so similar in the approach of we start with either blood or bone marrow as an input, and we're using centrifugation to segregate all these different cells. And then in the end, we want to target specific fractions and get as many of them back as we can. And in a perfect world, you would be able to get as many as you can in just a little small volume. And that would give you the highest enrichment, most potent dose for a low volume injection. So that's what I look for, the ability to recover a lot in a little bit of volume. So not having to take a ton of plasma or a ton of red blood cells in my final output, but having the option to add plasma to that so that you could achieve a higher volume and, you know, technically you'd say, oh, well, if I made three cc's of 10x and I added three more cc's of platelet poor plasma, so now I'm at six cc's, oh, you've diluted to 5x. Is your PRP only half as effective now? No, don't be silly. Like, the number of platelets we're injecting into that joint is exactly the same, whether it was 5x or 10x. But I would argue that 5X in that scenario is actually better because we're providing more platelet poor plasma, more A2M, more IRAP, more fibrin, more cytokines. So don't always get bogged down in, oh, 10X must be better than 5X. Look at it holistically. What's the number of platelets we're giving back? What's the number of white blood cells? What's the number of stem cells, et cetera? 
So that's how I go about picking my system. And I have to keep in mind the thing that I always mention it last, and it's not necessarily the least important, is the sterile break issue too. Because if if it is like a true lab setup where you've got 10 test tubes and you're mixing and matching, that's terrible. Um, if it's got ports and tubes all over the place and you're constantly moving syringes back and forth between a bunch of things, you're introducing a possibility that one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in a million are going to get a contamination and you don't want it to be your patient. So keep it safe, but achieve the functional result, which is a customized high concentration and customizable volume output. Perfect. Well summarized. Thank you. Um... There's a couple questions that aren't, they don't have to do with PRP and we'll kind of focus, stay focused on PRP today. Um, looks like we'll just have one or two more questions. Let me just refresh here, make sure I'm capturing every question. Are there, um, you, I think you touched on this briefly, but if you don't mind maybe repeating, uh, what are the top, what, what's this, what studies, let me read this, summarize this right. What indications or, or joint injections do you see most commonly used or most effective for PRP? Soft tissue injuries. Uh, if you've got some kind of chronic non-healing uh, tears in the muscle and the tendon, tendonitis, tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, uh, I think I said tennis elbow, um, uh, str I, yeah, th those are the type that respond to either PRP. I think probably leukocyte rich gets you even a more potent outcome. Uh, Joint injections, I would probably say leukocyte poor because we're not trying to irritate the inflammation and the arthritis by adding the inflammatory type of white blood cells. So by injecting a, a buffered plasma solution that's rich in A2M and IRAP, as well as platelets that provide growth factors and cytokines, we're feeding and nourishing the damaged joint. So knees, hips, uh, facet injections, I would say for all those things, leukocyte poor. Intradiscal injection, jury's still out. Perfect. Last question that I see here is, can you be more specific on how to separate uh, on a centrifuge, the whole, let's see, whole blood, or basically how do you separate, or how do you separate in a centrifuge leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor solution? Um, if you recall the, the cartoon that I showed when you, after you centrifuge blood, red blood cells are about half the volume in the tube and they're, they sit at the bottom. They're the heaviest or most dense of the cellular components. Then you have a thin white layer called the buffy coat. That buffy coat, uh, at the red interface, the heaviest white blood cells are multinucleated white blood cells. And those are the inflammatory ones by nature. Just above them is the mononuclear white blood cells, which are not, not usually inflammatory. Um, and just above them is the platelets. Now, depending on how fast the centrifuge is spinning, how many G-forces is going on that, that determines are the platelets mostly floating in the plasma above? Are they floating just barely above the buffy coat? Or are they actually pressed down into the top of the buffy coat? Then, based on which process or device you're using, will determine how do you pull out the layer you want. When you spin it hard, the white blood cells and platelets are so close together, you can't achieve leukocyte poor. Because to get the platelets, you have to pull the white blood cells that are right next to them. If you spin it in a way where the platelets are kind of hovering right above or they're up in the plasma, then a device may be able to drain off the platelet poor plasma first, and then get into the area where it starts to get platelets, and it can collect platelets without necessarily collecting the white blood cells or red blood cells you don't want. 
Now, if, if leukocyte rich is what you're going for, that device can continue and collect the the red blood the, in the whole Buffy coat, basically to get leukocyte rich. And they're going to get a little bit of red blood cells as they're pulling that Buffy coat off, just the, the few red blood cells at the very top of the red blood cell stack. And that's why the leukocyte rich PRP looks red in color. Um, but different devices on the market go about it differently. Uh, I don't want to get into naming different products names, but there are some automated systems that start collecting the red part first. And then when they start to see white blood cells or platelets is when they start to collect product. But that's also what leads to some of this ambiguity of, is it really a leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor product? And do you really have control over a volume and still getting a good recovery? Other devices are really better about letting you dial it in and removing an entire plasma or red blood cell fraction separately and then pulling out the stuff you want at once so that you're not seeing as much mixing of the layers. And in turn, you can get most of the platelets or the buffy coat in just a couple of cc's of volume. Perfect. One last question. It might be my favorite question of the day. Uh, I think a friend typed this one up. Does Dr. Murphy use PRP to grow a beard like that? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes about those kind of topics. Like sometimes I get asked questions. They're like, uh, is PRP great for hair loss? And I said, I, I really hope so. But if I knew it to be true, I think I would have been the first one enrolled in the PRP hair restoration trial. No, that's good. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, for your time. Uh, we have this lecture recorded for those that signed up but weren't able to join. We'll go ahead and send that out to anyone. And if you have any questions, contact um, our crew at Army uh, Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute. And uh, you guys have a great day and join us in September for the next uh, webinar, which will be Dr. Uh, Bert Mandelbaum talking about orthobiologics for treating acute sports injuries. And then please join us in Tennessee for our conference coming up in uh, next month in August. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Good night.